Episode 5 starts with a teeny tiny party boat on the lake that the bad guys are headquartered upon. For some reason, we get a rendition of Rhythm of the Night by Debar. Netflix must own the rights to that little ditty. They're scoping the joint with a sniper rifle, literally. They then break into what I thought was a houseboat, but it's more of a boathouse. You can see how I could get those two confused. Paul now seems to be permanently tripping balls while Haggerty is coming around. Everyone else seems to be doing pretty good, which makes it surprising when McKnight and Gomez start swinging moonshine from a mason jar. Lerner now has access to an ancient Windows 2000 PC and some walkie-talkies. These walkie-talkies seem to just fall apart at a touch, revealing their inner workings. Quite odd. I wonder how long it will take them to realize that they're on a lake and have an inflatable raft, allowing a practically silent water crossing. Thankfully, this boathouse has a flatbed scanner so they can get a print off. What, what is that? A parachute? Anyway, they get an ID almost instantaneously. Good work, team. Gomez has given Paul her unloaded gun in order to remove him from the area. He's supposed to go back a ways and scope the joint and relay positions. What are the chances he finds some rounds, or even better, there's a round in the chamber? Trunk and the Hua are tied up in the attic and have had their lips taped, which is immediately ripped off. Clearly, they didn't think about that. The writers just thought, tied up equals tape on mouth. They also seem to have the loosest ropes around their ankles. They're basically loose enough to slip out of. Trunk is still going with the whole starving guy who's describing the food he can't eat act. Chicken fried rabbit with cut and tail sauce. De rule, de rule. But the creepy Walton Goggins light is there with his torch tools and he's going to do a bit of deep sounding. The ripping and the tearing, the wild woman. The Russians are in the freezer still and are contemplating escape with what appears to be a frozen bull penis. Delightful. McKnight, Gomez and Winters swim across the lake and each takes out a guard and a vehicle. Winters lucks out and gets yet another super horny guard who falls for the old I'm so horny trick. Where did they get these guys? Surely you would understand that there's intruders already. So maybe now is not the best time to get your end wet. So the bad guys whip down trunks, uh, trunks and find out he's packing some heat. Yet another penis. This time it's the real BBC. So just before Trunk gets his pipes descaled, the prosy agrees to talk. I actually wasn't aware that they were after information. I thought they were just torturing them. I'm still unsure why the three intruders didn't meet up again before entering the building. Cover more ground that way, I guess. But they leave themselves open to being taken out one by one. Paul gets another hallucination of the Green Goblin who wants him to smoke the wacky tobacco. Paul tried to mag dump into the gobbo, but realized he was duped. No rounds. But for some reason, the hallucination has the ability to tell him where the ammo was dumped. How convenient. I'm betting he actually saves the day now that his teammates are isolated. Is genital torture acceptable on TVs these days? Chunk's getting a rod shoved in his bell end and he's screaming like a quite reasonable person. McKnight's going to save him, but Winters wants to concentrate on the nuke. I'm noticing that these three are just openly talking into their headsets. Why can nobody hear them talking? Here we get the trope of a recorded message accurately describing what is going on in the vicinity. There's a boxer size system that's playing a recording and instructing that it's butt kicking time and crush it, etc. Exactly when those words would describe the fight between Gomez and the guards. So corny. But at least Winters and Gomez are together. Would be nice if Gomez had a weapon more appropriate for close quarters combat instead of that crossbow. Hell, even just using the bolts as a melee weapon would be better. Bit of a continuity error here after Paul gets his ammo. McKnight has a guard near him and Paul is scoping right to left. Then it shows him from the reverse angle, scoping left to right. So anyway, Paul starts blasting. Lerner rushes outside to grab the gun off him, but the guards know it was from across the lake. Of course, Winters has to blame it on McKnight. McKnight crashed through a skylight just in time to save Trunk's wedding tackle. There's an acceptable fight scene, though I'm not sure what happened to Creepy McCreeface. But I was a bit disappointed that Trunk choking Mr. Baldy didn't end with a face full of Wayne. Paul and Lerner are going to get haggard into the raft and across the lake for some reason. I guess now they're all about keeping the team together. There's a pretty hammy bit of gung-ho attitude followed by the quiet, how do I work this thing that we've seen a million times before. Time for some more doodle shots as McKnight has to pull out the torture device from Trunk's nether regions. They have a little callback to earlier when Winters pulled the bandage off and they discussed that you shouldn't go on three. But now I know you're going on two, so it's ruined. But I swear they went on three here. Did they act like they went on two? We also get to see that Creepio was unconscious and is now on the offensive, which McKnight counters. And Trunk jams the Willy Shredder 2000 up his nose and asks him how it smells. Pretty graphic and reasonably cathartic. But when he presses the button and it shreds his eyeball, I thought that was a bit too much. Could have just had his eyes roll back in his head, but I guess we're going full gore here. A bit disturbing. Of course, the Lady of the Night uses this opportunity to leave unannounced. Well, she is blonde. 
She overhears the big bad guy tell a goon that they are leaving in five minutes and should kill the Russians and meet them at the van or he'll be caught in the blast. Wait, didn't they disable the vehicles? Or is this a new van? Why are they heading to get a new van if they already had vehicles? No one told them they were disabled. Are they just assuming? The Russians escaped the freezer somehow. I guess because the guy who was going to kill them was murdered by the hooker, they somehow get out of a locked cool room. There's mutiny in the ranks, however, and they want to still do the deal to get the money. Seeing as they can't reach back up, Winters walks into the fray and offers a deal of the money plus immunity. Paul's meant to be holding the rope to the raft with Haggerty in it, but he's too busy checking out happy snaps of his daughter. Shouldn't they have hauled Haggerty onto dry land? Anyway, he's out of here. Some weird editing and continuity in the shootout. McKnight and Trunk turn up and blow Winters' story. So Cauliflower Ear blows away the mutineer. Get it? Mutineer? Mutant ear? Then Winters gives a signal and a shot is fired from behind her. The camera starts panning around but shows Gomez nowhere near the origin of the bullet. I couldn't work out who was where in this fight, and it seemed there was some pretty heavy plot armor because named characters were in the open a suspiciously large fraction of the total battle. The big bad ended up doing a runner after shooting Cauliflower here, and everyone seemed to have run out of ammo. Maya bails them up as they're about to get in the van, and there's a pretty bad joke about blowing them all away, which is followed by more terrible continuity as she loses control of the recoil and sprays the ceiling, but is then shown not spraying the ceiling. It's a mess. Maya gets shot and somehow Paul's there. When did he leave the shore of the lake? She's bleeding to death, but I can't care because how do I know it's not a hallucination? Paul just said, please let this not be real. Is that a hint that it's all fake? They really took the wind out of this show's sails with that stunt. This feeling is exacerbated by immediately cutting to a happy song as Haggerty floats around the lake after dawn. Haggerty bumps into the party boat from earlier, so I guess that's why they showed so much attention at the opening of this episode. Chekhov's punt. They're really focusing on this chick singing these songs unconvincingly. Sony shows up in the credits, so I'd assume they must be trying to promote this chick. This episode was okay, I'll give it a 6. It had some jokes, some landed, some didn't. It had some gore, a lot of penis shots almost to the point of obsession. The fights were okay, a bit confusing, but I just saw them as a way to progress the plot. Even Paul seems to be sober now. So there's three episodes to go and we still need to get the nuke back, of which we now have no idea where it was heading. In fact, weren't they in the process of detonating it and now it seems to be on a short timer after being dropped? Winters should be pissed at McKnight for firing the sniper rounds that Paul actually shot and for ruining a bluff, both of which should be easy to explain. The real issue is the lack of believability of Maya's death. They survived a chopper crash at the end of an episode and Paul was acting as if it was a hallucination. So, you know what? Because I can't actually tell what's real and what's fake, combined with people escaping from the inevitable, I'm dropping it down to a 5. You can't do this kind of thing and expect us to just go along with it when it's convenient. You betrayed my trust and now I'm skeptical. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows, and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Mixie, thanks for your time, and have a good one.